so it's 11.30 here. So thank you, Fabian. Let's start the uh, fourth lecture on structure formation. Great. Um, right. So uh, just as a brief recap, um, yesterday we discussed um, simulations of structure formation. And um, so let me, we discussed and body simulations and that there are these bound dark matter structures that we call dark matter halos and that we think galaxies form in them. And so let's move on from there. Uh, we're not quite at galaxies yet, right? But that's our goal is to get to galaxies. Uh, same, no update to location, but um, yeah, something I don't think I showed yesterday. Maybe I did show it. No, I think I did show it was the halo abundance. So the number of halos as a function of mass, um, and you can see it's a very smooth power law abundance with the exponential cutoff at high masses. So very, very massive dark matter halos are extremely rare. Right? And uh, we'll see that this comes out of um, the Gaussian statistics of the initial density field. So there's a nice, extremely simple and yet powerful um, picture of halo formation, which is the spherical collapse picture. So imagine you have an isolated spherical symmetric uniform overdense region. So imagine basically that you have a patch of background universe like this light shaded area, then you cut out a sphere out of that unperturbed universe and you compress it slightly, right? Then you have an overdense region separated by a vacuum from the background. Um, and it turns out that if you have such a setup, you can solve uh, for the evolution of this region exactly up until collapse. And in fact, you can solve this in exact full relativity. So there's no, you know, we're assuming, of course, again, just dust here called uh, collisionless matter and maybe dark energy. Um, but even so in this case, you can really solve it exactly in relativity. Um, and it turns out that the space time inside this overdense region is the same type of space time as in the background, Emery, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker, but with different cosmological parameters. Okay, in particular, this is going to be spatially curved, a spatially curved patch. Um, so that's one way to derive the equation for the evolution of this region to just basically derive the Friedman equation in this modified um, background. Or one can also resort back to Newtonian uh, theory and say, okay, I have an overdense region. And so the gravitational acceleration is just GM over R squared, M being the closed mass, and that's equal to R double dot. Right? So both of these full relativistic or Newtonian lead to the same result. The only thing is that you have to, if there's a lambda term, if there's a cosmological constant, then you have to add an additional outward going uh, repulsive force is basically from the background expansion. Um, good, uh, so that's the equation of motion. So what happens then, um, so if you neglect the lambda term, make it even simpler, then there's actually an analytical parametric solution that corresponds to just a semicircle. So if I plot, oh, sorry, I should emphasize here, R is the physical radius, right? So the proper distance between the center of the sphere and the outer edge, not the co-moving distance, right? So that's very important. So now if you plot the time evolution of this, the radius of that circle collapsing region, it shows this behavior, okay? That's just this parametric solution. So it initially is increasing just because it expands with the rest of the background universe, but it, it continues to expand more slowly than the background, eventually turn around, eventually R is zero, uh, sorry, R dot is zero, right? And it turns around and then recollapses. Okay, and the top panel here shows the density profile, which is basically just a cut in the radial direction here. Um, so this is known as separate universe picture also. Um, you can think of 
really, if you're a local, if you're an observer here in this region making local measurements, there would be nothing to tell you that you're not living in a Friedman Robertson Walker metric with some curvature, right? You could only by communicating with these outer regions could you tell that it's not a background universe. Um, so yes, that's right. There's no Hubble drag to R because um, and the physical velocity does not decay, right? It's um, remember that this velocity I we're using and the rest of the remainder of the uh, lectures decays because we're always referring to observers moving with the background, right? With the expansion. Here I'm referring always to fixed physical locations. And so their velocities remain constant. So it's kind of a it, subtlety in the velocity definition is relative to which observer um, do you uh, measure your velocity. So in this case, R dot is just the physical um, velocity, not making re uh, reference to any co-moving observers. Um, good. So um, yeah, so that's the uh, collapse solution. Notice uh, that, uh, okay, you might wonder about this RTA and TTA here. Uh, those depend on the initial conditions of um, uh, basically at what point and with what overdensity did you start this region, right? If it's a hugely overdense region, it will of course collapse faster. But nowhere do we refer to the overall scale of the region, the overall mass of the region. So basically, uh, the overdensity of the region, fractional overdensity, is what controls everything here. And what you can show then is you can also compute how the same region, with, starting with a given small initial overdensity, evolves in linear theory, right? Just with a growth factor. And you can show that um, the collapse at a given time, uh, this is the collapse time here, right? When R reaches zero, that this happens at a given time whenever the, this linearly evolved overdensity has a value of delta critical, which is 1.686. Okay, it's a little uh, subtle, uh, this um, linearly extrapolated thing, but basically uh, no matter the size of the region, as long as it has a certain initial overdensity, it will collapse at a given time, right? That's the idea. Um, and this solution, there was a question about cosmological constant domination. This solution neglects the cosmological constant term, right? So. Uh, in principle, uh, if we consider collapse today, there's a small correction due to the cosmological constant. It actually modifies this critical collapse threshold uh, by a very small amount. But it can be taken into account um, by just integrating this numerically. So this idea that I just need to know the initial um, overdensity of an isolated spherical homogeneous region to determine whether it collapses to a nonlinear structure today, um, that leads to a whole picture for halo formation. So imagine I take um, my initial Gaussian linear density field. Uh, well, linear, I mean, I can multiply with any growth factor, right? It's, it remains a Gaussian field. I smooth it on some scale that corresponds to a mass scale um, that I'm interested in mass of a given halo. And now I can say that any region that is above this threshold will actually have collapsed to something roughly of that mass, right? Um, so basically there's an idea, uh, there's a, a semi-analytic approach to calculating halo density field by just computing the linear density field, smoothing on a scale, and then identifying the regions that lie above the critical collapse threshold. And uh, because recall that the, you know, I keep repeating this at least once every lecture, right? So the variance of density fluctuations on large scales is small, right? So if I smooth with a large scale corresponding to massive halos, I will get 
much smaller density fluctuations, correspondingly, there will be very, very few regions that are above the threshold, right? Because say they're going to be a five sigma excursion in order to cross the threshold. So that explains why very high mass halos are rare. So this is really a nice physical explanation why very high mass halos are rare because density fluctuations are small on those scales, um, the linear density fluctuation. And so you need an extreme, a rare excursion in your Gaussian uh, probability distribution uh, to cross that threshold. So this idea with some uh, refinements is known as excursion set. And um, it is definitely rough. It's not a, a replacement for running simulations, but uh, it gives us a nice physical picture of uh, where massive halos form. OK, so, so much for halos. Um, I now want to move on to, um, to galaxies. So, so far, basically, what we've been dealing with is, um, uh, is, is this kind of density field here, right? Which is just the density field of cold collisionless matter, mostly, which is dominated by dark matter. So if I plot what's the light emission of this, um, you know, what uh, can I observe? I just get this, right? It's all dark. Uh, so we want to know how to get to the actual light distribution. So for that, I'm going to try to summarize galaxy formation as far as I understand it. I'm not an expert on this either in a few minutes. So basically what happens is that um, initially, as long as pressure forces are negligible, gas just follows the dark matter component. So it, it just keeps collapsing along with the dark matter. Um, but then, um, you know, the gas has some temperature it's been cooling ever since it decoupled from the photons uh, in recom during recombination, but the gas has some temperature, right? So that means there is a genes mass and uh, objects smaller than that genes mass, uh, you know, the uh, cannot, cannot collapse, right? So the gas uh, stays, uh, collapses uh, only to larger objects than that genes mass because of the pressure. Right. For smaller objects, the pressure of the gas is sufficient to halt the collapse. On the other hand, though, larger objects uh, will not have time yet to collapse, right? Because they need to cross that critical density threshold to, to be able to collapse. So there is initially is an epoch of uh, where nothing happens really until, um, until basically um, objects larger than the genes mass uh, start to collapse. So uh, you would think then, okay, so everything stops at the genes mass. The thing is that a gas has, you know, gas interacts, right? It can, gas atoms can collide and the collisions can cause excitations and these excitations lead to radiation. And once uh, you know, the gas radiates, it, it can cool further, right? So eventually, as the gas gets thin, as the gas gets denser, it can cool further and it can collapse further um, because the genes mass now is smaller. And that keeps happening. It's a runaway process until the density is so high that um, nuclear burning can start and then you have the first stars. And so once you have a collection of stars forming, then you can start talking about a proto-galaxy and as structure grows, it, it continues to accrete gas. This is kind of the process shown here. Um, there's, you know, some arrows showing, this is showing basically the gas motion. Um, and there's some ingoing motion. Ga the galaxy continues to accrete gas. On the other hand, the stars, of course, generate energy, they radiate. And that radiation pressure and that heating of the surrounding gas can stop the additional accretion. So there's some regulation going on due to this feedback of stars on, you know, pushing back on the accreting gas. Uh, eventually, these stars go supernova, the most massive ones, and the supernovae uh, leave behind neutron stars and black holes. Those black holes, in turn, can also generate a lot of feedback um, due to gravitational energy um, that is being released as they uh, accrete matter. And so that also pushes, pushes back out the gas. So the whole 
story of galaxy formation is this interplay of gravitational accretion and feedback. Um, and here is a video also from the illustrious TNG project. Uh, so this, the main panel shows gas, and you can see um, there's continually stuff infalling. Um, this is at early time, so redshift, now we're at redshift three. Um, and continuously, you know, you can see other photo galaxies or galaxies falling in. Um, this panel shows the, the stellar component. So depending on what wavelength we would observe in, this might be how the galaxy actually looks in observations. Um, and on the left, you see the, um, the overall large scale structure, just the, the cold matter component, uh, the dark matter component. And you can see there is, there occasionally you see feedback effects. Um, so now we're switching to, uh, um, to look at, I think this is metallicity now. So we're looking at different properties of the galaxy. Um, you can see that clearly the distribution of matter is very complex. Um, and occasionally you can see um, feedback events that actually push gas outwards. So up there, there's, for example, there was just some stuff flying away. Um, so it's very complex. And the whole goal, of course, of this simulation, well, not the goal, but one of the things you want to see is a nice disk galaxy emerging. Right? So uh, this is clearly a very complicated process. And you know, this is a cutting edge simulation. And we're just you know, recently uh, able to simulate realistically realistic galaxies really in a cosmological context, right? So this is a very new thing that we're able to do that. And for that, you do have to put in quite a number of kind of recipes, parametric recipes for how you treat the small scale physics. Um, so uh, still, yeah, so this is more than M-body simulation because it also has gas, right? When I talk about gas and it's hydrodynamics, and there are different ways to treat hydrodynamics, but it's definitely not just an n-body simulation. Um, so basically, how do you form? So basically, in these kinds of simulations, uh, there is um, you put in a threshold and say if gas reaches a certain density, then it forms stars to a certain fraction, and that density threshold is not a realistic threshold, right? Because we don't have the actual resolution to go to the star formation. So there is some effective recipe for forming stars. It's not a full simulation of, um, of real stars. And that's another uh, area where people are continuously working on is improving uh, this recipe for star formation. So, uh, right, so there's a question, does this hierarchy of small stuff forming earlier and then later assembling to larger stuff also hold for galaxies? Um, yes, uh, that's an excellent question. And very roughly it holds, yes. So today, in today's universe, we see, for example, massive elliptical galaxies, and we think that those formed out of mergers of smaller mass galaxies. Um, so that, to some degree also holds for galaxies, but it's not nearly as clean and clear as for uh, the structure as a whole. So galaxies are quite a bit more messy because of this feedback, right? So uh, if you have a massive black hole forming, that can actually stop more gas from accreting. So it's not clear that, um, you know, forming structure just means you're gonna accrete more and more. Um, yeah. So, um, right. So that was my nutshell to galaxy formation. Uh, so basically, um, right, what do we really want to do? Uh, we want, I mean, we don't hope that, um, you know, we can encode, you know, the, that the shape or this galaxy or the fact that it's at this particular location can tell us anything about cosmology. What our hope is, is to use the large scale distribution of galaxies, they're clustering um, to tell us about um, cosmology, right? So how can we 
model this galaxy clustering. Um, as I showed, there are you know, really strong simulation efforts, but they are far from being realistic and certainly not over cosmological volume. So we have to come up with some effective recipe that is different, uh, that is faster, basically. At the same time, it needs to be more flexible to uh, encode all the possible physics that um, galaxy formation can depend on. So one common approach is to take halos in n-body simulations. We know those have solidly understood properties, solidly converged, at least in this gravity-only setting. Um, so, uh, so those are robust. The only question is, how do we assign galaxies to halos? Uh, one approach is known as halo occupation distribution, where you just have a parametrization that of mostly, you know, given a halo mass, you know, you have a distribution of number of galaxies per, the, uh, per halo, uh, given the mass that you sample from. There's another approach where you really try to not just count halos, but identify the individual substructures of halos um, that we saw in the, at the end of the last lecture, and then basically populate those. And the idea there is to really try to just say, okay, I have a galaxy sample with a certain number density, and I'll just mass order the subhalos and populate them until I get to that number density of galaxies. So these are both physically motivated. I think their underlying physical assumptions are to first order correct. But um, you know, there are many types of galaxies. And we always, in our surveys and observations, we select certain types based on very complicated properties of galaxies in general. So there's absolutely no guarantee that any of these approaches really match that. It's very hard to quantify the error we are making. So an alternative approach that is closely linked to what we discussed in these lectures and that I'll uh, pursue for the rest of this, this lecture is to basically uh, parentize our ignorance and follow an effective field theory approach, which is really makes minimal assumptions. Okay, so the idea is to really not assume anything at all about galaxy formation, except that it's local. Um, and, you know, incorporate all the uncertainties, I mean, every possible scenario that fits this assumption uh, into free coefficients. So this only works if your work on large scales where perturbation theory is valid. Okay, but this, to me, provides another very strong motivation to study perturbation theory in the first place, because, you know, it offers us a way to look at galaxy clustering um, in a model independent way by basically, by being, by following a perturbative approach, we can really incorporate all uncertainties of galaxy formation into our model, into these three parameters. So basically the idea is to do the same as we did in the second lecture, which was perturbation theory of, of the matter component. And, you know, so well, the basic framework is exactly the same, but now we need to take into account, of course, that galaxies are not simply matter, they form out of variance, and their number is not conserved, unlike matter, right? So galaxies can merge, and, um, and so their number is not conserved. So what we'll do, starting point is, again, we'll write the galaxy number density, uh, we'll Phrase it in terms of fractional perturbation relative to the mean of the galaxy density at a given time. And that's called delta sub g of x and eta. And we'll expand that in perturbations. Okay, so that so far, everything the same way as for matter, it's just delta g instead of delta m. And then uh, our goal is to have an expression for delta g at any order any desired order that we care to go to as a sum of observables, which I'll call O, that we can compute with three coefficients, okay? So then I if I write the galaxy density like this, sum over B O times O of X, 
So now uh, consider a fixed time slice, okay? For simplicity, let's just suppose I observe galaxies at a certain redshift. Then uh, these BO are just constant. And so I can compute the statistics based uh, of delta G, based on the statistics of O that I can compute. And uh, then I have a certain number of free coefficients that I have to allow in my model, but it's just a finite number. And hopefully we can allow these coefficients to vary and still get cosmological information um, out, of, out of galaxy clustering. So it's, I think it's clear that we need, uh, it only works if we have a finite number of these O, right? If there are infinitely many, we will not have any chance to infer cosmology because we have uh, infinitely many free parameters. So now the goal is, um, the goal is to identify what are these O things and how many are there. Okay, so let's step back a bit and talk about um, like how does galaxy formation happen in the whole space-time context? Um, yes, a question. Yes, these operators are fields, fields constructed out of metric perturbations and the density. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so again, we're dealing with always with statistical fields in cosmology, right? Um, so right, so um, consider a space-time view uh, with time running along the vertical axis and space along the horizontal axis. So my claim is that galaxy formation happens in, in this gray region, okay? So what is this gray region? So this gray region is a narrow region in space and encompassing a fluid trajectory that leads to the final observed galaxy position. Okay, so uh, remember that uh, we can write fluid trajectories in perturbation theory um, or follow them in embodied simulations. And at even, uh, and I am claiming that the matter, that the formation of galaxies is only influenced by a small region in space around uh, this, uh, this trajectory. So what, what, what does that mean? It's, a, it's just a, um, maybe a roundabout way of saying that gas formation happens on small spatial scales, right? So the stuff that forms the galaxy comes from relatively nearby in space, but it happens over long time scales. So if you remember that video I showed earlier, right? It was running from redshift eight until redshift zero or one. Right, so it, it really showed a long period of time. I mean, a considerable fraction of the universe's age that this galaxy took to evolve. So, so that is something we have to take into account. But all the stuff that formed the galaxy, um, basically almost all the stuff has to come from within this Lagrangian radius of the parent halo, right? So um, the parent halo of the galaxy formed out of dark matter that was within this Lagrangian radius, like we discussed um, yesterday. And so uh, basically all the gas that forms the gas comes out of a similar region, right? It, gas is just as, doesn't travel any further than dark matter because it's cold. Um, so, um, right, so that's, um, so that's the, the overall picture. So for us, this is, is quite nice because if we're thinking of long wavelength perturbations uh, that we're interested in when we are describing um, galaxy clustering at large scales, from the point of view of these long wavelength perturbations, galaxy formation is basically spatially local. So we don't have to deal with the details of what happens within this region. Um, but the time dependence is, is a separate issue. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Um, so now I'm claiming uh, that the quantity we have to care about that galaxies um, know about along this trajectory in this region is the tidal field. So the second derivatives of the gravitational potential. Sorry, it should read psi here, not phi. 
the, which includes the density as the diagonal, as the trace of this, right? Um, so that's my claim. Um, if you recall, those of you who have taken relativity probably know that the tidal field is the leading gravitational observable um, because um, basically gravitational effects are, if you go to a lead, fall, freely falling frame, then gravitational effects are to leading order tidal effects. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, in a bit. But okay, so let's make it even simpler and even ignore the time evolution for now, right? So then if I ignore the time evolution, and I said already anyway, that spatial, galaxy formation is spatially local, then I can, I really have a completely local uh, relation. So I'm saying that my galaxy density at position X and time eta is just a function of partial I, partial J, psi at this X and eta, right? And if I have such a form, then it's easy for me to come up with a bias expansion because this guy, psi, and its second derivatives are you know, first order perturbations, right? So I just do a Taylor series in this and I stop at whatever order I want to, to go to. And now um, on the left-hand side, I have the galaxy density, which in terms of the spatial indices is a scalar, right? It's a three scalar. So, um, these indices also need to be contracted within themselves. So what we then arrive at is a bias expansion that includes the first term is just um, the trace of this guy, right? I need to contract the indices and that in turn is just proportional to delta. And at second order, I get for sure then delta squared, right? Second order uh, Taylor series. And I also get uh, another contraction of these indices, uh, which I'll phrase as Kij squared. That's a convention we use uh, is just to make the Fourier space kernels. Um, it's just more practical. Okay, so Kij is directly proportional to uh, partial i, partial j, psi. Uh, sorry, there shouldn't be a partial i, partial j here. I need to fix that. Um, right. Okay, so um, maybe the technical details are a bit much, but basically uh, think of it as if we have a local bias relation in this form, then our problem is solved because we can do a Taylor series and this derivatives of this function fg, uh, I can always just phrase as my free bias coefficients. I surely don't know what this function is, but I just need to turn it into fixed coefficients. Right, and so that's the nice thing about perturbation theory. I can always stop at some order, right? If it was, if I was trying to do this fully nonlinearly, I would need to know what that function is. If I have to go to second order perturbations, I know this reduce, function reduces to three fixed coefficients. Um, so right, um, so this is what we call a local bias relation. But now we said that this is, cannot be true, right? Because the galaxy doesn't know just about uh, the tidal field today at its location. It knows about its entire past history. So we need to include the dependence uh, on this entire past history. So one formal way of writing this is to say, okay, uh, sorry, uh, I took these slides from earlier talk uh, with fixed plots, so um, now eta is shown as tau, okay? I hope you um, can deal with that uh, notation clash. So, so, right, so I have a non-locality in time, so I need to imprint, promote my function of the tidal field to a functional, right? So now my galaxy density depends on the tidal field along this entire past trajectory, which I call um, X fluid of, of tau prime, eta prime, right? So how do I deal with that? Of course, um, that seems pretty bad because um, how can I do a Taylor expansion of this functional, right? It doesn't seem possible. Um, we said that this evolution takes the better part of the entire universe's history. And over that time scale, certainly, Psi 
the gravitational potential evolves significantly, so I, I can't do a, a Taylor series. But luckily, uh, the scale-free nature of gravity comes to the rescue. So, um, so to see how this works, I'm going to go back to this linear term, right, delta, okay, which is the trace of, this, of the tidal field. Okay, so let's consider this functional just in terms of delta, and let me make it even simpler and just write it as a linear functional. Okay, so I'm working completely at linear order now. I just want to see, you know, at linear order perturbations, how do I deal with this non-local and time formation of galaxies, which seems quite a big problem. So a linear functional, I can always write as an integral, right? So uh, my galaxy density should look something like this, like integral over d tau prime, like d eta prime, times some kernel, that's a function of tau prime, times the density at that uh, time along the fluid trajectory, right? But now I know I'm, I'm just interested in linear order, right? So now I know that growth is scale invariant, in other words, uh, scale independent. So in other words, I know delta I can write as growth factor times some fixed density, linear density field at some reference epoch, right? So now I plug this in here. Well, now I can pull out this delta one because it's independent of time. And I can do this integral formally. I don't really care what this kernel is. That whole integral just becomes some B1 of tau. Okay, so I end up back with my local bias relation. Kind of a miracle, right? But this is just the the uh, just comes out of the fact that um, the perturbation theory, the growth uh, separates into a spatial dependence and time dependence. So if I now go to second order, it's clear. Okay, so at at second order, I can write it density field as the linear part d of tau times delta one of uh, the, at some reference time plus uh, growth factor squared times delta two, like we saw, right, in lecture two. Um, and, and so now I can plug that in again, and now I get, um, I get two terms, right? I get this, uh, this integral with uh, growth factor and this integral with growth factor squared. So, okay, I have two different coefficients, but it's still a finite number of coefficients. And so at any given order in perturbations, I'll always end up with a finite number of coefficients because with whatever term I have, also delta squared, right, I can do the same thing. So in the end, it, I'm able to actually come up with a finite number of terms. And it turns out that there are a lot of, um, or a significant number of degeneracies even, and we can reduce this, the number of terms because uh, we only need to keep terms that are linear, uh, linearly independent from each other. Okay, so through so this miracle of this factorization uh, in time and spatial dependence of perturbation theory, I can actually solve the issue of non-locality in time. I can take fully into account that galaxy formation is not local in time, but um, you know takes a long time. Um, and basically still end up with a fixed finite number of free coefficients. So actually, uh, to make the long story short, um, at second order, this is still completely sufficient. There's no new term generated. It turns out that the delta two term that I argued here, that should be there, this delta two term is in fact degenerate uh, it's just a linear combination of delta squared and tidal field squared. So by allowing for these, I already took it into account. So at uh, second order, this is actually the complete bias expansion. Good, so uh, we dealt with this clearly important issue of non-locality in time. Let's go back to this local and space thing that we assumed, right? That clearly cannot be fully exact. So um, it's actually, it turns out to be in some sense easier um, because, okay, so what do I need to do when I go beyond uh, perfectly, um, the perfect local approximation? 
So if I go to smaller scale perturbations, they start to probe inside the region um, that, um, you know, that forms the galaxy. And so I have to take into account spatial derivatives of these bias fields, in particular, spatial derivatives of the density. But again, I'm dealing with a scalar, right? So the first linear term is actually the Laplacian of the density, because the gradient of the density, I wouldn't have anything to con contract it with. So gradient of the density squared I can have, but that's second order. So to leading order, the spatial non-locality is included by including Laplace delta. And as a coefficient, I'll introduce this r star squared, right? Because I, to, to make it dimensionless, I need a length scale squared. Um, or uh, in Fourier space, equivalently, it becomes a k squared. Okay, so if you remember uh, the end of the second lecture, um, we actually encountered this already, right? We encountered this in two cases. First, from including the effect of the, of the stress, uh, the effective stress um, or velocity dispersion of matter, and from pressure uh, in case of baryons. And here, we're, it's exactly the same thing. So it's not a new term. It's exactly the analog for galaxies of this effective sound speed. Right, so this example here, we've already discussed. Um, right, so, um, so, so let me um, make this a little bit more rigorous perhaps and argue why uh, I was always fine with writing things like this just as a function of the second uh, derivatives of the potential. Um, right. Um, so the general EFT approach would be to write down all the terms in my galaxy bias expansion, more generally in your Lagrangian or equations of motion or whatever um, interesting object that you have that are consistent with the symmetries. And in this case, I already mentioned this, I think, in the second lecture, uh, we have general covariance from the fact that we're dealing with gravity. And uh, the symmetries of the particular object we're looking at is, well, it's a zero component of a four vector, um, the momentum density. That's what the galaxy <laughs> density is, right? Is there a question? or? Um, so, um, right, and so we do that, and then we have to order contributions because in general, there are infinitely many of them, and we'll do this by perturbative order and by a number of spatial derivatives. Okay, this is really, again, the same thing as we did for matter. So uh, let's, what is this general covariance? Um, in our case, basically general covariance boils down to the statement that um, psi, the gravitational potential, the gradient of the gravitational potential and the velocity cannot appear in the bias expansion. Why? Because they are not invariant under, they're not consistent with covariance, right? Psi, I can change by reparameterizing my time coordinate, gradient psi by um, doing a time dependent spatial shift in coordinates. So, um, if those terms were there, I could remove them by going to a different coordinate system. And the same thing applies to the velocity. So what does that mean? Um, so I cannot have psi, I cannot have gradient of psi, but I can have second derivatives of psi. Okay, and that's what we did, right? And uh, the density, well, I already have that included because the second derivative, the Laplacian of psi is nothing but the density. So then you might ask, okay, fine. What about uh, the uh, velocity divergence though? Clearly that's something that the galaxy density might depend on or more generally the velocity shear. And that's absolutely correct. The thing is that those are solutions of the Euler equation, right? And if I'm allowing for a general, for the galaxy to depend on the general time evolution of second derivatives of psi along the fluid 
trajectory, then I can also solve for these guys. So these will be redundant, basically. Okay, so um, um, so let me, before moving on, this might have been quite a bit uh, abstract. So uh, let's go back to this spherical collapse model. So because what is this bias thing, actually? Why is there any bias in the first place? So, so we said, right, that in the spherical collapse picture, um, halos form at these rare excursions of the linear density field that cross the threshold. And now it turns out that even if you just look at Gaussian random field and identify the high excursions, the clustering, so the two-point function of these high excursions is larger than the two-point function of the underlying field. Okay, so they cluster more strongly than the underlying field. And you can see this uh, roughly in the sketch because what we did here is added a long wavelength perturbation to the field, right, it's indicated by the red line. And so you can see that, um, you know, there's somewhat of a perturbate. I mean, so the density field itself is clearly a bit larger here on average than here. But the number of the regions above threshold is hugely boosted here, right? So there's three time, three guys or four guys over the threshold uh, at this peak of the density perturbation and zero at its trough, right? So there's clearly these things seem to cluster strongly. And if that doesn't convince you, which um, I mean, I fully agree, is that it's just a very hand wavy argument, you can actually because this is a Gaussian random field, you can work out analytically what the two-point function of clustering regions is. Um, and for this, it's useful to just work with the um, real space definition of two-point function as the joint probability for two points to be above threshold, one at x plus r and one at x divided, normalized by the probability um, for any given point to be above threshold. Um, so you, you can use that definition. And then on large scales, large separations that we're interested in anyway, you can actually expand um, the result. And you'll find that the two-point function of these thresholded regions, so this THR stands for thresholded regions, which is what we're doing here, is given by a bias factor squared times the correlation function of the underlying field itself and higher order corrections. Okay, and this is precisely um, the linear bias term that we, the linear order term that we introduced in the bias expansion. Right, so, okay, so um, what's our goal? Let's not lose sight of our goal. Our goal is to compute the statistics of galaxies, right? So let's go back. Uh, so we have this expression. Um, there's one final ingredient we need, uh, which we didn't talk about for matter, which is present for galaxies. Basically, get the galaxy density field um, is not a smooth field, right? It has noise in it because, well, the way we identify galaxies observationally is we usually make them discrete, discrete objects, right? So it's clear that, you know, I can take my density field, I can <coughs> add more bias fields to it, and then I continue to retain a smooth field, right? So uh, what about this discrete nature? Um, so you can think of that discrete nature, if I want to describe something discrete, as adding noise to it, you know, just Poisson noise in, uh, at some level. Okay, and in the effective field theory approach, actually this arises also out of the, um, uh, you're basically forced to introduce this noise once you once you do co loop computations. And I don't, you know, this is getting technical, so I don't want to um, uh, uh, say too much about it, but suffice it to say that this stochasticity at leading order is a Gaussian random field with just a constant white noise power spectrum. And so even though it's a field, Right, we can still characterize it by a single number, namely the amplitude of that white noise power spectrum. 
And so similarly, this continues to a higher order. Good, so, um, so what do we have to do now? Uh, we have to um, compute the kernels, right? The kernels corresponding to delta G1, delta G2, and so on. Um, we call them Fn for the matter density. Let's call them Fgn now. And example, in the homework, you can compute what uh, the second order kernel is. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, it involves the second order bias parameters, um, the coefficients of delta squared and tidal field squared. And, and that's basically what um, we can continue that to higher order. We know what bias fields appear. We can express them as kernels, and um, we just, um, yeah, obtain the kernels as a function of bias parameters. So finally, in the last little under ten minutes, uh, we can get to calculating statistics. So for now, I'll neglect uh, additional observational effects that are important, but um, that we'll get to tomorrow. Uh, so I'll just assume we know the true intrinsic uh, galaxy positions. Well, in other words, we can measure the rest frame density field of galaxies. Then um, the leading order galaxy power spectrum is just given by this expression. So um, again, we're at linear, linear order, right? So we know this can has to be proportional to the linear power spectrum. And then we just have the B1 square terms from, uh, um, you know, from the, the bias expansion, right? B1 times delta was the linear bias term. And we also have the noise term that in general is important to include. Uh, so we have two free parameters. If we want to fit the observed galaxy power spectrum, we have to leave these two parameters free. Um, I should mention that um, people sometimes approximate the noise as which would mean that actually the amplitude of this noise is directly related to the number density, the mean number density of galaxies, but that's in general not a good approximation. Um, we can discuss that in the Q&A if there's interest. Okay, so things get, of course, more interesting once we go to next to leading order. Remember, for matter, we did this computation of two there were two different loop terms that added and went to next to leading order, and then this EFT effective sound speed counter term, right? And it's it's very similar for for galaxies. Um, let me start with the result though. Um, so this focus just on the the red line, which is the galaxy power spectrum. Here we say H instead of G. Um, that doesn't matter. So, um, right, so the red line is, um, is the linear predict, no, the dashed line is the linear prediction, and the solid line is the, um, the one loop prediction. Okay, and the, the right panel shows the, the ratio of the linear to nonlinear. Details are not important. What's important, as always, is that um, the deviation from the linear theory become big on small scales, right? That's precisely the same as before. And actually, we can use the same scaling arguments as we did for matter. Um, so uh, we can say there is an expansion of the loops and an expansion of the higher derivatives. Um, in that case, the matter sound speed, and in our case, this higher derivative bias. So it's exactly analogous. It's just that we have more free coefficients. One thing I should mention is, um, so in the matter case, this effective sound speed should be controlled basically by the same scale where matter becomes nonlinear as determines the loops. In the galaxy case, we could imagine a case where galaxy formation is um, is extremely local or extremely non-local. Uh, for example, uh, consider the case where a galaxy formation is somehow influenced by radiation coming from distant sources, then this scale, R star, could actually be quite large, right? 
course, we have to hope that this is not the case because it would really make our life uh, difficult in trying to get cosmology from galaxy clustering. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that in general, uh, the expansion, there's basically the K nonlinear of the loop expansion that's the same as for matter and, um, and a separate scale R star for, um, uh, for the non-locality of galaxy formation. So um, again, I mentioned it's the calculation is similar as for matter, but we have, of course, much more free coefficients because we would try to incorporate all of the uncertainties of galaxy formation. So in this case, we have five additional parameters. In the matter case, we have had only one, the effective sound speed. So this um, freedom, these three coefficients, unfortunately limit the cosmological information that's available in particular, just in the power spectrum. Um, just as an example, right? So we have this, at linear order, we have this bias coefficient B1 um, that multiplies the uh, linear power spectrum quadratically. And that's the same dependence as growth factor. So if I don't know B1, I cannot measure my growth factor from galaxy clustering, right? Because it could either be, um, a big growth factor with a small bias or a small bias with a big growth factor, I don't know. And so um, there's a lot of interest in going currently in the, in the field and going beyond the galaxy power spectrum uh, to look for more cosmological information. And so one uh, obvious example is, is the bias spectrum. Um, because the bias spectrum is something we can compute. Uh, we saw how we do it for matter um, with the same type of computation, we can do it for galaxies. And several other um, statistics have been developed, voids as an example. Um, so people are really um, uh, looking into new ways to get additional cosmological information. But it's important, I think, to stress that the power spectrum is always kind of the basic statistic that we have. So, you know, if you understand all aspects of the galaxy power spectrum, so matter perturbation theory, the bias expansion, and the observational effects we'll discuss tomorrow, then you're in a very good shape to also look at more general statistics. Um, right, and so the main ingredient missing right now, I mean, we have a galaxy power spectrum, right? That's nice. Um, we can't quite compare to observations yet, because we have to um, um, do an additional step in connecting to observations called redshift space distortions. And that's what we'll look at tomorrow. And then we'll finally have our desired prediction for galaxy clustering. And then we can look at um, what other physics we can probe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fabian. Um... So there are a couple of questions in the, uh, <clears throat> in the chat. Um, so uh, Dabi Mukherjee, uh, he or she is asking at what point in time is the black hole injected? I guess this has to do with the uh, feedback maybe. Yeah, with the simulation. So, um, well, so the simulations, there are different approaches, I think. Um, I actually don't know whether they use seed black holes that are there from the beginning or that they just put in at some point, or if they really self consistently say, okay, I have a, a very massive star. Um, you know, again, uh, there are star particles that don't really stand for individual stars. Um, but uh, then stochastically, you say, okay, maybe the star goes supernova and then it will produce a black hole particle, right? Um, so that's, you know, th there are these approaches. I think what's important to keep in mind is that, you know, star particle still has millions of solar masses, right? It's not an individual star. It's kind of a representative of what the overall population of stars might be doing. Okay. And, uh, and Andri Andrija, Andrija Kostic. Uh, yes. She's asking, uh, if you could comment on the decreasing importance of the higher order in bias expansion. For example, if you take ice in the sitter, 
the growing, uh, the growth function goes like E of uh, A of T, E of tau, and that's increasing. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, we have seen, of course, and um, so, sorry. Uh, we have seen for matter, I mean, I showed this plot for the matter power spectrum where the one loop term was much smaller at richest one than at richest zero, right? And here, unfortunately, yeah, I should have indicated the redshift dependence here. So the fractional correct, it's the same story here. So the fractional correction of the next two leading order is expected to scale as k over k nonlinear to this to some power. Oh, I'm sorry, so this we, cannot, is, we cannot see our whole plot here. I'm, I'm seeing. Uh, that's weird. I'm seeing. Uh, I'm seeing I, oh, I, OK. Now? No. OK, I don't know what happened. Um, let me try again. So basically, um, so what I showed today was this depend. Can you yeah. see it now? Yeah. Okay. yeah. This dependence on K and L. Um, and this is a redshift dependent quantity, right? So at higher redshifts, K and L is larger. And so the loop corrections are smaller and we can extend perturbation theory to larger scales. Uh, so to smaller scales, sorry. Um, that of course, one caveat to that is that assumes the bias coefficients are the same, right? So, you know, if the question is of course, um, what are the bias, higher order bias coefficients? What are the values, right? If they grow strongly for your galaxy sample towards higher redshift, then maybe that does not hold. So we actually don't really know for observed galaxies how much we can go to higher K at higher redshift. I think it depends on the galaxy sample. And right now we don't really know that yet. We also don't know what the scale R star is, right? So it's really early times in this uh, whole, whole business, right? So, yeah. You're okay, thanks. Uh, and one more thing, um, can you hear me well? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, one more thing, can you go back to slide four, uh, 38? I think that's where you showed uh, matter, matter, halo, matter, and halo, halo. Yes. Can you comment just on uh, this behavior that, well, I understood that linear is the dashed and nonlinear is the solid line, right? Right. And now if you look yes, at matter, so, matter and, and halo, halo, it's a different trend. So you see yes. that at higher order. Yeah, that's so a good point. Uh, I was, uh, excellent question, I was running out of time. Um, so if you look closely, squint maybe, and look at the dashed lines, you can see that they're all the same shape, just shifted by a constant. In other words, multiplying different factors of bias, at least on large scales. And that's exactly as expected, right? Because there's just a factor of B1 um, between them plus the additive noise. So if you look at the matter plot here is exactly what I showed uh, in lecture two. So now you see a different behavior of this nonlinear corrections, right? So that again, depends on the values of the bias coefficients. So for B1, um, this argument with the thresholded regions indicates that we kind of always expect B1 to be at least one um, for halos or around one, for, sorry, for galaxies, certainly not less than zero, right? Mm -hmm. But the higher order bias parameters could be positive or negative. And depending on that, they could enhance the power or decrease the power. And similarly, the corrections to the noise that we actually included here uh, could be positive or negative. So we picked some values, which we thought were motivated, but um, I think it's important to say these are guessed values, right? So in other yes. words, um, this red curve could also go above the dashed curve easily, right? right? So it also kind of depends, it depends uh, which on order the... we stop as well. Um, yeah, but so let's, just, let's go to the regime where the one loop is the leading correction, right? Mm -hmm. So let's assume on these scales where my mouse is right now that the two loop is negligible, right? Even then, um, it could, with what other, other values of the bias coefficients, it, the line could, the red, the solid line could be above the dashed line. Right, okay, I see. Um, and I so see. in this plot, actually these shaded bands indicate 
what happens when you vary the coefficients by some fixed amount. And you can see, yeah, it goes positive or negative. Um, Yep, yeah, thanks. Okay, so, so these plots are also in the book, I suppose, right, Fabian? This one is from the bias review, which is also in the literature uh, list. So the book actually does not go all the way to computing the one loop galaxy power spectrum. I was being <laughs> ambitious today. Uh, it was a lot of stuff, I realized that. Um, but tomorrow should be more. Uh, hopefully more um, broadly accessible tomorrow's lecture. But so I did want to, you yeah, know, sorry, I did want to go uh, to this, to this final result at least once because I promised. <laughs> That's actually very nice. Um, so Walter Riquelme has a question that uh, maybe you're going to get into observational constraints later, but is there some current constraints on higher order bias parameters? Uh, excellent question. So, um, the answer for halos and um, so for for halos and simulations and for galaxy samples constructed from halos and simulations, the answer is yes. Uh, in particular for halos, we have pretty good um, measurements for um, essentially all of these, actually um, all of these ones shown here. For galaxies, for real data, no, we don't really know um, because there is, of course, people have um, confronted this model with the data. Uh, they've gotten constraints from this. But as you can see, all these bias parameters in the power spectrum are very similar. So you basically constrain some combination of these bias parameters. And even those are not very uh, well constrained. So in summary, for galaxies, we really uh, don't know yet much about the uh, nonlinear bias parameters. Sometimes it just marginalize over them. Yes, that's right. I mean, uh, when you look at cosmological constraints, they're always marginalized over, yeah. Um, so there's another question, uh, Juan Yan is asking, he or she, assume we can constrain our bias parameters, does galaxy distribution give us any information about dark matter distribution? It's not clear to me. Um, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, so, so for example, uh, let's go just back to linear theory, right? Um, if we happen, so this noise term becomes important on relatively, on smaller scales. So if you're restricting to larger scales, then basically the galaxy density field, and you can neglect the noise, then the galaxy density field is just the matter density field multiplied by V1, right? So we are seeing basically a rescaled version of the matter density field. So if you don't care about uh, how large the fluctuations are, but just where there's an over and under density in dark matter, then yes, the galaxies tell us that. Um, so in other words, the correlation coefficient of the galaxy density field and the matter density field becomes one on large scales. Um, we just don't know the overall amplitude, right? Because of this bias factor. Then as you go to smaller scales, it becomes progressively difficult because we have the noise term and we know that galaxies are not a linear tracer, they are nonlinear. So we, it, it becomes more convoluted. Um, so I guess it depends on um, exactly what this information about the matter distribution is that you want to have. If, again, if you want, just want to see where are large scale over and under densities, then uh, we can we can say that yes. Okay, so there's another question, but maybe you should save. Renan, is it okay if you save your question for the Q and A because it's already ten minutes past? So please write write it in the LSS channel, and uh, we start from there. So thank you, Fabian. Thank you, everyone, and uh, we resume in one hour and twenty minutes. Okay. See you then. Okay. Bye.